fact, uh, we talked briefly about an object in space. This is 3D and our goal is to turn it from 2D into 3D. And we're going to start with some lovely exercises in turning from 2D to 3D, plus also talking about diffusing colour. So I'm going to show you my palette. And, oops, <laughs> and my keyboard. <laughs> There's, oh, get rid of that one, hey, over there. There we go. Now, we need to work out which colors diffuse and which ones don't because then we can, and when we're uh, painting our little shapes, turning them from 2D into 3D, we'll be able to work out which colors aren't going to move or diffuse, which is the correct term for it, and which ones will. So let's start off with my color here. This is phthalo blue. I'm going to paint, I've got lots of tubes over there, so a lovely little wet batch over here, and in here I've got a thick batch, and that's the basis of what we're going to be doing is you have a watery, watery batch and then you have a thick batch so that you can add tone. So create the shape. I've just drawn it, but you could just begin painting. It wouldn't matter. And paint over, paint over, paint over. And dip into the lovely dark stuff. And... I'm putting in a bit of tone and I instantly begin to turn that 2D flat object into a 3D object. I'm doing it really, really simply. And I'm going to write down the color. This is phthalo and it does diffuse. I discovered that yesterday. Um, there's so much to know about watercolor and all the different colors that it's just absolutely fascinating. Now here is cobalt blue. Yeah, you can buy cobalt, you can buy watercolors in these incredibly large 60 mil tubes. Um, I'm going to put cobalt blue in this special spot right here. Fresh paint so that I can dip into the lovely thick stuff. Fresh, fresh paint. And wash that one off and pick up some cobalt and repeat the exercise. Pal, pal, pal color over there. And I'm going to paint this one with a flat wash. I'm being reasonably careful there. Flat wash. And and stick my brush straight into that lovely viscous blue, straight out of the tube practically, but I am massaging it a bit so that it paints. Because I find if you'd use it straight out of the tube, it kind of just sits there. And then to the bottom of that form, some lovely thick tone. And this way, we're just doing a quick little practice on the shapes. Plus, we're automatically looking at form. This is cobalt. Uh, let's try another color. This is phthalo blue turquoise. And I'm pretty sure that's what I've got in here. <laughs> so I'm squeezing out some fresh stuff. And again, Wash my brush, get a little bit of that color, a little bit, little bit, create a lovely pale wash, pale, pale, pale wash, and a little flat wash. It's the prettiest color, phthalo blue turquoise, as is any version of turquoise. All right. Flat wash, and then stick your brush into the thick stuff, but I'm massaging it around a little bit. It's the, what I'm loading on my brush is really, really, really thick, but also paintable. Okay, and in 
I'm going to add some lovely tone. And instantly create a 3D shape just by adding that lovely bit of tone. That colour is Thalo. P-H-T-H-A-L-O. Great, great word, isn't it? Thalo blue turquoise. So I'm going to guess that because it's got Thalo in it, that it will diffuse. So we're doing two things at once. We're looking at form and how to create form, plus we're looking at diffusion. Now, I also have some permanent violet. Um, I don't know that I'll play with that right now. I've got some permanent yellow lemon. It lives permanently on my palette over there. And again, wash your brush. I really wash it this time because we're talking about yellow. And get a nice watery version over here. And perhaps I'll do another circle. Circle and then I'm grabbing a bit of water so I can go straight into the thicker stuff. And instantly turn it from 2D to 3D. But we know that yellow is the lightest colour, so you're going to have the smallest range in tone there. So turning it into a turning anything into a 3D shape using yellow is going to be one of the hardest things you can do. So I'm going to write it down as well. It's permanent lemon. I've also got magenta, quinacridone magenta, which lives permanently on my palette down here. Do another shape. Oh, look at that pretty green in there. Just creating that on my surface. Okay, little bit. Wow, how intense is that? That's fantastic. I want a pale, pale version. All right, here's a pale version. And create another one of these kind of like leaf shapes down here. I haven't been caring uh, so far about a light source. So we'll talk about that in a moment in case you want to include a light source in your shape. It's so wonderfully uh, intense that um, magenta. I'm just adding a little bit of water to force my magenta to move a little more. Okay. And that one was quinacridone magenta. Okay, we're going to let that dry so that we can come back and look at which colours diffuse, which don't. That's going to help us make a decision about which colours to use in the uh, exercise. So I'm just going to set that one aside for a second. Don't want to put anything on my keyboard, so in case I tie <laughs> it types in all by itself right this is ash smooth <laughs> i was about to say and i've already mentioned that but that's uh, on the other youtube live that i had to stop because my internet crapped out I'd like to blame the provider there but let's not turn this into a provide a bashing session even though I'd like to because it was going so well. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I've been trying so hard not to cough. I've got two lovely sheets of Ash Smooth and I was mentioning that it's smooth because it literally is beautifully smooth to feel. Also because it got, it's also called hot press and it goes through a, a heat press process in order to make it beautifully smooth. The next smoothest surface that you might have is called cold press and it's um, reasonably smooth but not quite as rough textured as rough textured paper is. And the reason why I want smooth is because I'm painting shapes that require a smooth edge 
and I'm painting straight to the edge all the time. So I'm going in for this lovely smooth paper. Now, I made a little video on these ones and uh, I taped my pages down, but I found that I was using so little water that I'm not going to bother with these ones. So I've got two lovely little sheets there. So our exercise is to create a lovely little random series of shapes and uh, glaze them, make it, turn each one from 2D to 3D very easily and then create an animal. And then the other animal that I thought I would do, because I've already done a cat and I'll upload that video in about a week's time, I thought I might uh, use this same method to create the seahorse. And um, so it'll be an abstracted seahorse. So I'll put that one over there. I don't need that and then that. Okay, um, they're still drying, so I'm just going to leave them be for now. I'm going to start. So this one's going to be abstract and this one's going to be a version of the seahorse or vice versa. It doesn't matter, of course. This exercise here was pure fun and it was just about creating shape, 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 shape. And I had no design in mind. I just began with some larger shapes and then got smaller. That was as far as my thinking went. So I'm going to do the same thing here, but try and vary it. So perhaps there's a shape this way. Perhaps there's a shape this way. I am pressing incredibly lightly, absolutely butterfly touch. And perhaps there's one that comes, oh, um, I really liked this foot. Um, so perhaps there can be a footed shape over here and it'll have a flat bottom. And then I just got smaller. So perhaps now a circular shape, wonky circle. Don't worry about the fact that it's wonky because it's just a lovely little exercise. Um, I loved these little small ones that I put at the top. So I'm going to put some small ones up there. And I'm just thinking about varying the shape, varying the shape. And I'm just building from the bottom up. Quite a great way to build an exercise, build a, any design actually, just build from the bottom up. I often uh, pick a spot and just build up. Okay, there's the basis of it. I'm just going to show you that a little closer so you can see random shapes. And it does have a base and then it builds up. And we can add so much more than that. But before we add color, we need to establish which colors we're going to use because we want to know which colors diffuse because that's going to help us with the glazing. I'm going to, um, is it dry enough? That one, that one, yep, they're all still wet. So let's draw some seahorse-like shapes. Okay, so it's got a little knobby bit at the top and it's got a, I'm going to give it a snout and the snout is going to have a shape like that. It's got this wonderfully big belly, so that's so asking to be a big oval. And at the back, it goes over there. When I say the back, kind of like the back of its neck, if you can find that, if you can imagine that's a, a, a back. Uh, it's kind of flat here, so perhaps I'll include a flat one. And it gets thinner, comes down, and then it comes around this tail that curves around like that and that. And then there's a head shape in there, but I've got the basis of it. I've got, I'll just hold that up again, a snout. I'll put a head in later. I've got a nice fat belly that I can expand on later. If there's any mistakes that you've made, now's the time to take them out. I've got one shape over the other, so I'm just going to erase the intersection, erase the intersection and erase the intersection because then I won't see those marks. 
I'm not going to redraw it in because I'm so easy to paint over. And again, erase the intersection. Erasing on hot press paper is an absolute dream. There's nothing to resist you. When you're erasing on um, when you're erasing on rough paper, oh, it just resists you because much of the graphite has gone from the top surface into the little surfaces. Um, right, so just erasing any intersections. Yep, that's it. Okay. Now, let's talk about glazing over these shapes here. Just zoom in a little bit so it'll be easier to see what diffuses and what doesn't. So these are the shapes that we've practiced already. The yellow was, uh, is, I can see, is a little bit wet and the magenta is a little bit wet as well. So I'm going to start with that one because that was the first one I started with. And I know from my experience painting the cat and the others that phthalo diffuses so it's probably going to depend a little bit on this paper. This was the ash that I was using, whereas this is some um, cheap paper that I'm just practicing on. So that will be an interesting exercise on its own. Okay, I'm going to paint uh, quinacridone magenta, this beautiful magenta, and paint it straight over the phthalo. Okay, so down here, can you see that streak of phthalo? And I used as little, as few brush strokes as was possible, but still it diffused and it's not a particularly dark version. And in this one I had wonderful darks. Oops, I just painted on the paper. I had wonderful darks and uh, they diffused really, really uh, quickly. So phthalo, yep, definitely diffuses. Now, cobalt. It's just a little bit wet there, so we know that would diffuse. Okay, I'm going to be forced to dry it. I was hoping it would just air dry sufficiently. Okay. Cobalt next. Uh, I think I'll just continue with magenta. And I'm going to paint it through the darkest part because that's more, if it does diffuse, it's more likely to diffuse. As few strokes as possible. And yep, it diffused as well. I did do it a couple of times there in my strokes, but sometimes that's impossible to avoid, isn't it? Okay, they both diffuse. Let's go to Thalo Turquoise, which I guess does confuse. I'm washing my brush each time because it's picking up a little bit of the under colour. Okay, very little diffusion, which is weird. So it's not about the fact that it's phthalo. There's so little diffusion. Could it be that it's not quite that dark? That's hard to know. Let's try lemon yet next. Really clean brush and create a shape over and yeah that lemon moved all over the place uh, the uh, it's definitely diffusing uh, right and the final one is magenta so i won't do magenta on magenta because it's too hard to see but i might do lemon on magenta because that will be really easy to see whether or not it's affected by the magenta okay color and Yep, and it just diffuses massively as well. Okay, all the colours I chose diffused. Uh, so my plan <laughs> was to make an exercise where we uh, could use some colours that didn't diffuse, and I of the five colours I chose, all of them diffused except for phthalo turquoise. So phthalo turquoise is in. Uh, Thalo itself is definitely out because it moved. 
Uh, the cobalt did move, but did it move less? Or I that's right, I did I did a couple of extra strokes, which I didn't intend to. And actually, if you think about it, the phthalo moved less than the cobalt, and the lemon just moved all over the place. So maybe I just won't worry. Maybe I'll just use any colors I like. It was a good plan. <laughs> And uh, all good plans are meant to be broken. I can see now that I've brought these back that they are a little dark. Just going to remove a little more graphite with my kneadable. I don't need those lines to be so dark. Uh, I know it's going to be make it harder for you to see, but I'm hoping you're painting along at the same time. That's what these Wednesday sessions are good for painting along, an opportunity to get out your paints. And my goal is to plan exercises that you can do in front of YouTube. Okay, I'm gonna start on this one because this one matters less. Oh, Helen says, Thalo took has moved for me. Why is that? Great question. Helen, um, so that's going to be partly affected by the paper. It's going to be partly affected by how much um, pigment was there. So if I'd put in a thick layer of phthalo blue turquoise, I'm going to guess that it would have moved much faster. And my phthalo here really was pretty thin. So the, any one of those factors, I'm going to guess. This one, I'm going to go with the lovely colours of my seahorse. So that it had this view, the, the photo that I originally used this from, which I don't know where it is in my archive, um, had this beautiful glow of uh, yellow underneath everything. It was so beautiful. And, and it did have a dark trumpet uh, nose. And um, it did have all these beautiful oranges in it. So I think I'll stick with that color palette for uh, the uh, seahorse. And um, so therefore I'm gonna use permanent yellow lemon and um, quinacridone magenta and phthalo blue turquoise. And I've got all those colors sitting there on my palette, what's more. I'm going to be using small brushes because these are really small. These are little A5 sheets, which is unusual for me. I'm going to start with my lemon and let's do a big lemon one. Big, big, big lemon. <laughs> this is a really big shape, so I could have used a bigger brush. There's not that many big shapes and I'm going to get uh, darker quicker. Right, and there's my thick. So I came in with the lovely light and then I've come in with the thick. That might be just beautiful later on when it diffuses. Maybe I should have made this an exercise in which colours do diffuse because uh, they're quite beautiful. When I'm looking at this one here, I mean, that, that's kind of pretty. I was aiming for glazing, but you know, I love the idea of going with the flow. So I've done a yellow one there. And while I'm loaded, no, I'm not, I'm going back to my pail. I was going to say, while I'm loaded, I'll use the yellow, but I ended up washing my brush. Doesn't matter. I'm going to put a yellow one over here. yellow and then dip into the thick stuff to get a tonal variation and therefore form. And let's do another one, wash that off so I can go back to my light tone. Let's do this one here. Bit of water on my brush, I need less water. Less water. Less paint, I should say, shouldn't I? That one's very watery, so I'm going to give it a minute. 
I could suck some up, but I'm just going to paint another one instead. Paint another one. Still plenty on my brush. I'm just going to keep going. And then I'll do three at once. Straight into the thick yellow. And, oh, it's so thick there's a lump on my brush. Don't want a lump, really. Hard to, they, you can't paint with lumps. Okay, and a little bit of tone into the yellow, a little bit of wet and wet, such a great wet and wet practice, this one. A little bit of colour down there, and I get form. Now, where else shall I add this lovely yellow? I'm just going to keep going with the yellow back into the watery yellow each time. Watery. So I'm going to keep going one, two. Maybe a little yellow one here. That one's touching, so I won't do that one. And perhaps a yellow one here. And then into the thick stuff. <laughs> On the session that ended, uh, because my internet went down, I didn't know it had gone down and I was sitting there talking away, painting. And I've no idea how much of it was being transmitted. Oh, that's pretty cool for those colours there. Now let's switch to another colour. That, I'm just looking at my palette to have a little look for what, um, I might get rid of these blues over here. And just clean them up. And then I can make a lovely big batch of phthalo turquoise over here. And mix up in the palette here the thick, a thick version. So mixing in pure paint with a little tiny amount of water. But I do find getting that lovely vis viscosity right is what's going to make the paint move. So if I drop it into, oh, there's a lump there. If I drop it in on my palette, it's not really moving. So I might need a touch more water. Probably not a great test on here. What about that? What about that? Hmm. Right. I probably need, because it's incapable, it is capable of the most incredible darks. I'm going to put a mid-tone just there. Lots of water. Lots of water to create a lovely... Green, and I realise now this is a different colour to the one that I tested earlier. <coughs> Excuse me, I hate doing that. If I was making a video, I could edit out my coughs, but um, I apologise for that. Okay, lovely pale tone over here. That's what we want to do some lovely ones. Now, if we go over those, we will just move the whole lot. So I wonder, I'll just show you my little design again. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's any shapes I can put in that have no connection to the yellow. And yes, there is. Okay. Up here, I've got this cute little circle. Good place to practice on the little abstract piece. Plenty of water there. So... Too much water, in fact, to put a colour in. Um, perhaps I'll paint in a lovely tall shape. I'm not bothering to draw now. I'm just painting straight on. Um, perhaps another little. I'll just keep going till I've used up lots of this paint. I love those little circles. Perhaps a semicircle over here. They're going to stay wet enough for me to drop in the dark shortly. There. 
Okay, here's my mid-tone. Let's see if that's dark enough to make an impact. Yeah, it is. It's dark enough to make an impact. And it's mixing so nicely that I'm able to move it around. That's what we want. That's great. And these little ones, I'm going to go in for the slightly darker version because they are small and very wet. So don't worry about them. Okay, back into my pale tone. Move it a little closer. And again, too wet. I just should have removed a little excess, a little bit of that water. Too wet. There's a little tiny one here. Uh, I'm just embellishing over here. I'm thinking that might look quite cute for the um, fin on the seahorse. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? This brush is still full. I'm going to have to put paint on the um, towel. I'll use a sponge and it's a little easier for you to see. That one's still too wet as well. Okay, into my mid-tone and okay, that one's too wet. So I'm going to go into the thick, thick, dark tone. This exercise is so reliant on your brush and your familiarity with it, which is why using the same brush all the time is a brilliant idea because you get to know how much it sucks up, how much it delivers. And when you're doing wet in wet and you're wanting something quite specific, knowing how much it sucks up and puts down is incredibly important. Okay, I'm just going to wash my brush so it's ready for the next one and I need to dry it off. Okay, let's do some lovely glazing now. Let's go into my magenta and I'll practice on this one. Our goal is as few strokes as possible. I'm going over the lemon but not stroking back and forth. And, oh, that's a bit too thick. Here's my thick magenta. You want it that thickness that it will um, 
spread out into your paint to turn your little object into a 3D object, but you don't want it so thick that it doesn't move. A little bit of trial and error there. Okay, wash it off, go back to my pale tone. I'm going to switch to my abstract one for a moment. Pale tone and go over the yellow, few strokes as possible over the yellow. And over that, come in with my thick magenta. Oh, keep picking up lumps, not good. There. And down there. So they're wonky shapes and that's okay. I'm just bringing that up slowly. A little bit of tone on the top edge and if I'm lucky that'll just crawl in really really slowly. Wash it off, go back to my pale magenta. Glaze over a few strokes as possible. Thick magenta, no lumps, and add some form. Generally, I am adding the darker tone towards the bottom of each of the shapes. So generally, I am thinking about a light source, but I'm not being uh, careful at all. Uh, back to my pale tone, over the yellow with as few strokes as possible. And over. In general, when you're painting in watercolour, it's always about as few strokes as possible so that you keep that beautiful, oh, big lump. Just get rid of that. So that you keep that beautiful lightness, that beautiful luminosity. Oops. <laughs> Just totally went wonky on the bottom. All right, a little bit into there. And, oh, another one. Too much water. I could see there was a big drip there. A few strokes as possible. And into my thick magenta. There's another lump. Thick magenta. There. Hopefully we're going to get that beautiful doubling up of, um, oh, that, like there, that beautiful example where the yellow is glowing through. And I'll just leave that for now. I think I'll come back to that to decide what to do. Wash my brush, pale tone. All right. This one here. It's starting to look a little bit like a seahorse, just a little. It will when I put the little snout on. Thick tone again. Yeah, so I was talking a little bit about using the same brush. It becomes like a uh, friend and you start to know what it likes and what it doesn't like back into my pale, pale tone. I did dry this um, and I wanted to do a pink snout, but um, I can see that that is quite wet. So I'm just going to leave that one. I know the yellow is dry. So I think what I'll do is put in some little round shapes on the tail. Very wet on my, my brush is very wet. <laughs> Look at that. Instantly the uh, turquoise moved and um, has changed the colour of my pink. It's very pretty. So this is the shape that I'm going for. I've got the snout, the belly. Oh, lovely opportunity for a wider belly just there. So the, another circle there. Okay, pale tone and exaggerate this 
stomach. People love to talk about seahorses and how they carry the young, the males carry the young. So many wonderful jokes that comedians can make about that. Uh, it's not moving. It's almost like the pink just dried immediately. Just get rid of all the moisture on my brush, pick up a small amount of my pale tone and just encourage it to move. Not ideal when that happens, but it is what it is. That didn't move at all either. So I'm going to wait till that's bone dry to see if I will bother to do anything about it. Okay. I've got a snout. I've got that little toppy bit on top of its head. That's a better stomach shape. Goes down there. The tail's going nicely. Oh, I haven't put my ducks into the little circles because this is all about form. So just get more dark paint down there. This is all about form. So it's really important to be adding dark tones to turn your shape into a duck, into something that has form. Okay, back to my shape. I've got a snout. I've got a top, I've got the back of the neck, the main part of like the chest, the belly poking there. Oh, I'm loving these little ones that I did, so uh, I might enhance them. Or maybe they're so beautiful I shouldn't touch them. No, nope, can't resist. Okay, I've got this lovely pale. Oh, no, wash it off. Pale, 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 magenta. All right. Push that one up there, make this easier for my hand. Put in some little tiny ones there, and there, and just painting over that turquoise. It's definitely moving. This one can come down there, instantly moving. That is. They're very wet, so I'm not going to put my dark in just yet. I'll give that a second. All right. Okay, we've got the that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Now, will I put in another semicircle? I'd like to make it, oh, I know. It's got this lovely flat shape there. So, perfect. I'm going to make it a semicircle that goes there. And up there, okay, a bit more paint up and touch that green, a bit more there, there, grab that magenta, thick magenta to put in the bottom tone. <laughs> I am kind of putting it at the bottom. So although I'm not being careful about my light source, I am generally putting it at the bottom. All right. Is it starting to look like a seahorse? I've, I'm nearly ready to add that one there. Oh, I have to do the uh, tone on the uh, – these are kind of like the fin – just a little bit of tone. I'm bringing it in to touch the yellow. Okay. It's needing the head to have a little more detail. The uh, pencil line is really easy to see down here. So it's, that always bothers me a little bit. I don't love that look. Uh, so it looks like a few more people found me. So um, while I let that dry, I have no idea how much of the last session came through and how much didn't. So just in cases, I'm going to give you a little brief uh, rundown what I've talked about so far. Firstly, I talked about diffusing. That was the first exercise that we did, and I did really simple shapes. I've avoided triangular prisms and 
uh, cubes and rectangular prisms because they involve precision and I don't find that fun. So I went for super, super simple shapes. And in this practice session, we were looking at two things. Firstly, how to add the tone to turn it from 2D to 3D, plus also whether or not they diffuse. My goal was that the diffusion would help us establish which colours to glaze over and uh, would diffuse the least. But in fact, I just found lots of colours that diffused a lot. Thalo diffused, Thalo blue turquoise diffused the least, but there was very little tone there. Helen commented that her Thalo turquoise definitely diffused. So um, perhaps Helen was using more tone than I used and that could be key to the process. If you don't want it to diffuse, you'd probably use less tone, more tone, more opportunity for it to diffuse. This was quinacridone magenta and it diffused as well. So that was a bit of bonus material in that one. I also talked about Linda Kemp's book, Watercolour Painting Outside the Lines, and how she has a beautiful section on diffusion if you want to look that up. The other book that I recommended, um, in the live stream that crashed uh, was this book here and it has its own section on form and talks about light sources and how to turn an object from 2D into 3D. Uh, look at this beauty here. It's just a using possibly three tones. The lightest light is the paper, the darkest dark, it's all done in pencil. And then this lovely mid-tone, this is a really excellent book and it's Walter Foster and I've talked about him before and they're still drying so I'm going to keep going. The other thing that we've been working on, I'm going to set these aside so I can't hurt them. The other thing that we've been working on is our folder where we're sticking in each week little bits about what we've been doing. Oh, look, my uh, granddaughter. Um, oh, Helen says, that's when I lost you at Linda's book. There you go. That's interesting. Boy, I sat here talking for a while afterwards. Uh, look, um, my granddaughter was with me and I was sticking stuff in and she came over and made a contribution. Um, which I absolutely love and and allow, which is kind of cool for me. Uh, elements of art. So we've done line, shape, colour, value, and today we are doing form. Next week we're doing texture, which is just completely brilliant and uh, will be something that we can explore heaps of times. And the last one is space. So then I've been sticking stuff in of all the stuff we've been doing all along the way, making myself some notes. This is line. This one was about shape. And I've been sticking in notes of information that I shared with you. Uh, this one, uh, this is shape again. And the examples that we did were inviting rounds and dynamic diagonals. So those two, I both stuck in both of those. And this was last week's. And uh, I really wasn't well last week, which created um, this hilarious painting that was um, something that I then chopped in half. So here's one half, and I've chopped off those bits there and put that lovely quote in, colour gets all the glory, value does all the work. Um, and that's what we were focusing on was value and uh so I wanted to show you that I had just chopped it up and played with it and we were going for fish in the moving water and um, so I played with markers and, and uh, gold pen because I love it and that was uh, just being playful. I just wanted to show you that because it didn't make it to the book but this one did and I chopped it down even further. Uh, but everything is an exercise um, the other thing that we did with the trees and we used a bit of masking fluid because we were talking about value and we mixed up three uh, tones. And when we were painting this, I didn't like it at all. But then afterwards I thought it's it's got some sort of um, uh, attractiveness in it and perhaps it's purely simply that there's these lovely round bumpy look things here. And, of course, lovely space for today's exercises. 
on form. So here's our abstract seahorse. These are very wet down the bottom there. This is looking dry enough for me to come in and get a pale tone, tiny, 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 tiny bit, wiping all the excess off so that I can paint over the nostril and instant diffusion there. And I'm just grabbing some darker tone to add to the little shape. Now, is this sufficiently dry for me to, I need to finish off by putting a little shape there. Just a tiny bit wet. Let's go back to the little abstract. Here is, the, there's lots of green up there. So let's balance it with some green down here. Get rid of the magenta. Here's my pale magenta. What other shapes? I've got lots of that big roundish shape. So um, I don't need any more of those. I think I need more of these lovely leaf kind of shapes. And um, perhaps there could be a small one from there to there. And... Uh, I can see the pencil mark on this yellow, so I'm going to add some circles there. And a little semicircle over here. And then I'll notice my pencil mark less. Let's do a third one before adding the darks. I think it needs a little small one down there. Okay, now dip into the viscous paint and add darks. Add darks. And add darks. Oops. Add darks. And a little tiny bit of dark on my little tiny circle. And I reckon that one's just about done. I don't know that I could make it any better. Oh, I know. I could do some little um, circles. I'm just going to pick up some magenta because there's, there's no magenta up the top. So a little circle. I like the little circles. I also am basically getting smaller as I go towards the top. Let's put one right up there. So it's reaching right up. Yep. And then into those tiny little circles, picking up some viscous paint again. Oh, more lumps. I think I'm going to have to clean out my magenta because it's just full of lumps. Thick paint on the bottom, thick paint on the bottom. Yeah, it's making no difference. It's so wet, my brush is just enjoying picking up some of that. I'm going to say that one's done. All right. So if you're enjoying the session, please give me a thumbs up. It always makes a difference. It tells other people whether or not to watch. It tells YouTube whether or not to watch. And I really appreciate the encouragement. Okay. Thank you to the person who gave me a thumbs up. Ah, okay. I'm nearly done with my seahorse. Little shape on the end. Let's start there. This is bled into here, so I'm going to do something about that. What shall I do about that? Helen says, on a different topic, would you recommend your ceramic palette? I'm going to just talk about that for a second. Thanks for asking, Helen. Great question. Um, I absolutely adore this ceramic palette. 
And uh, when I bought it, it cost hundreds of dollars. And what has happened is that there's now a knockoff available and um, I'm not going to tell you where because I think it's a travesty because this has been designed by Stephen Quiller and I bought the original from him. However, it took me years to commit to buying it because it was so expensive but unfortunately now you can buy uh, a knockoff that, and I haven't tried it but this is the most extraordinary palette I've ever ever uh, painted with and I feel like this is going to be it for the rest of my painting career because it's just completely brilliant. It isn't even slightly transportable so I never take it anywhere when I go and run workshops um, but I do find that um, I can mix paint easily. It's got to be on a beautifully flat surface uh, so when this, um, I'm working on such an old table and when it, it recently began to tilt and I noticed that because my paint began slowly mixing on one side a little more than other than the other. Um, it saves me having to swatch all the time um, because you, you can kind of swatch right there and then. Uh, it also um, allows me to think about colour theory so everything is laid out. And uh, I've just made a video on um, the colors that I use in this uh, palette because I'm trying to go more and more for a transparent palette. I was totally getting into, oops, you can't see that over there. I was totally getting into these um, beautiful, it's sitting right over there on the outside, um, granulating colors. And then I discovered that in fact, those granulating colors are also really uh, opaque. So I've knocked back working with them and trying to limit the amount that I work with them, not use them as a brown. If I'm going to use a brown, then quinacridone gold because it's a transparent gold or use uh, burnt sienna. Um, and there's a transparent burnt sienna available too. So I'm just slowly moving towards the um, a transparent um, palette. Good question. Thank you, Helen. I'm going to put in the last little bit here on my um, seahorse, which I think is this little shape needed up the top there. Oh, and it's a semicircle that's calling me. I think it can have a green top. Wash my brush, pal pal green, wipe off excess. Go over that. Join all these little shapes together. You can see the the magenta diffused immediately. Here's my pale, here's my dark. So I've just given each shape a little bit of form and given each shape that little bit of form by adding a tiny little bit of tone and uh, darker tone. Okay, how's that? It looks hilarious. That's what it does. <laughs> uh, and that's all right. Hilarious is really, really wonderful. I've enjoyed myself. And next week we're going to come back and we're going to paint tone uh, texture, which is uh, pure fun and definitely going to be a landscape. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I really hope. Oh, thank you, Helen. Says great information. Thanks, Marianne. Ooh, excellent news. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you can guess. Um, <laughs> you can probably guess where I've seen it for sale and I'm not going to say it out loud and <laughs> thanks Dave that's really cool and and Helen yeah treat yourself absolutely it's totally worth it thank you so much guys and uh next week I'm sure I'll have no internet problems <laughs> bye